Welcome back. If you're watching this through Moodle, then hopefully Moodle has already asked you this question and given you feedback on your answers, but let me just quickly go through it. So this answer that the momentum shouldn't change because it's always conserved is not really correct. Momentum in an isolated system is always conserved, and since the universe as a whole is an isolated system, we think, we think that the total momentum of the universe is always conserved. But in real life, most systems we encounter are not isolated. Also, the momentum can't be changed by the forces that the carts exert on each other during the collision. Those are internal forces. Only external forces can change a system's momentum. And D is missing the whole point of momentum. There are an infinite number of ways the velocities of both carts could change, but conservation of momentum sort of magically chooses one of the ways which allow the momentum to not change even though both velocities do change. And the answer about measurement uncertainty is also incorrect. Even if the momentum didn't change at all, then sure, measurement uncertainty would mean that our initial momentum would almost certainly be different from our measured final momentum. But if we correctly account for measurement uncertainty, we should find that they agree within uncertainty. So the answer is simply that it's friction. Remember, the system is not isolated because of friction. The friction is weak, that's why we're using low friction carts, but it's still there and our measurements are likely to be sensitive enough that we'll be able to see the effects of friction. This sort of issue that we're running into in this experiment is part of why we often have multiple versions of physical laws. So the law of conservation of momentum, which you could look at this experiment as a test of, is often stated this way. Or for an isolated system, the total system momentum is conserved. But there's really important fine print here. This is only for an isolated system. And so here's our other statement of conservation of momentum, and it could be stated this way, that any time we observe a momentum change for our system, we can always account for that change by considering external influences. Experimentally, this is really a more useful version of the law. Now we know that we're going to take some data before and some data after, use them to get initial and final momentums, and then even accounting for uncertainty, we expect the momentum to have changed because of friction. An immediate question is how much data before and after should you use? And unfortunately, there's no simple answer. Remember that if all you have is random uncertainty, then the more data you use, the smaller your uncertainty gets. So that says you should use a lot of data. However, here we don't just have random variation, we also have variation in the data due to friction. And that will cause the uncertainty to get larger as you use more and more data. So somewhere there's a sweet spot. There's some very complex analysis that we could do to figure this out, but it's way beyond what you can do in this course. So here's what we'll do. Have a look at your velocity data get a sense for how large the variation due to random uncertainty is, and by, say, imagining a line through it and the rise of that line, how large the variation due to the friction is. You want the variation due to the friction to be smaller than the random uncertainty. That's good enough for our purposes. So now we know roughly how the analysis is going to look, but let me just go through a few more details so that you know what you're doing. So you're going to generate momentum versus time data, and it should look something like this, and there will be some change in momentum from what you're calling your initial time to your final time. Our hypothesis is that that change in momentum can be explained entirely by the effects of friction. So we want to measure a rate of change of momentum, right? A, a derivative of momentum with respect to time. But that's just a slope. So what you should do is take the bunch of data you're using before the collision 
and use a best fit line to extract a slope, and that tells you the rate of change. This allows you to predict what total change in momentum should have occurred just due to friction. It's going to be that rate of change times the time interval. But note that we only expect our change in momentum that we measure to equal that predicted change within uncertainty. Now, you don't know how to get the uncertainty in the rate of change, and so this equation on the right side, you don't know how to get an uncertainty. That's okay, there are ways to do it, but they're beyond what we can do here. But we can get at least an approximate uncertainty for the left-hand side. So you will have an estimate of your initial and final momentum with best estimates and uncertainties. Your change in momentum is just the difference between those. Well, that's just going to be the difference between the best estimates. But how do you get the uncertainty in that? What we are doing here is called propagation of uncertainty. We're taking two numbers, each of which have uncertainties, and we're calculating a new number from them, and we need to know how to get the uncertainty in that new number. Well, there's a complicated and general way of doing this, which many of you will actually learn in a statistics course later on in your degree. But for now, there's a simple way that will get it for us approximately. Just think about it. If your measured final momentum is higher than the actual value and your measured initial momentum is lower than the actual value, then you could be overestimating the change in momentum by more than the uncertainty in either the final or the initial. And so we expect the uncertainty, be uncertainty to be bigger than either the uncertainty in the final or the uncertainty in the initial. So what we're going to do is just add those two uncertainties to get the uncertainty in the difference. This is not quite right. It overestimates the uncertainty, but it's actually not far off and for us, it'll be good enough. As a final note, I'll just say that even when you account for random uncertainty and for friction, you may still see an apparent lack of conservation of momentum, and that is because the real world is messy, and there are likely things going on here that we're not accounting for. So, for example, if you analyze it carefully, you'll probably see that your rate of change of momentum before and after the collision are pretty different. In particular, I can guarantee that any time the carts are moving in the same direction, the system's momentum is changing faster than at times when they're moving in opposite directions. Maybe it's clear to you why that would be. If not, don't worry about it. Maybe it'll be clearer once you've thought about forces more later in the course. Another thing is that we are pretty much assuming that friction causes constant accelerations of the carts. But that's likely not true. If this was kinetic friction, which we'll study later in the course, then that would be approximately true. And kinetic friction is, I will claim, simple. You may disagree with me later in the course when we've looked at it more. But what's really going on here is what's called bearing friction. Be friction in the bearings of the wheels of the carts. And it is very complicated, generally not constant, and has all sorts of other things going on. And so you may see non-constant accelerations due to friction. Oh well, we do what we can. Good luck.